just want to remind you that uh, there is a component in this course that I gave at the very beginning to do a portfolio. And we are approaching the end of the term, so if you haven't spent any time on that, you should get started. It is a self-study assignment. And I have put up a video on how to construct your web page and how to upload it. I know a few of you have done it and shown it to me, but uh, very few so far. That's worth about 5% of the total weight in the class. So if you have forgotten, this is a reminder. That's uh, due on the last day of class. I'll go into that website and check whether you have done it and whether it meets the requirement that I laid out. In the last uh, lecture, my graduate student, Tom Scher, uh, came and uh, gave a lecture on plotting facilities in MATLAB. So I am in the process of making up an assignment. I'm kind of slightly behind, but hopefully by end of today, I will have your next assignment up. And I'll send you an email once it is ready. And that will involve quite a bit of plotting, uh, generating graphs, uh, using all the things that he has covered um, how to import data from Excel spreadsheet into MATLAB, which we have also seen before, and um, how to use uh, uh, is NAN to detect not a number of data and get rid of it from the table, and then how to generate plots, single curve, multiple curves, and uh, labeling them, uh, generating legends, etc. So, and. Uh, <coughs> What I'm going to do, we have about three more lectures left in this course, and uh, just one, one, one lecture a week. And I'm going to do basically problems, preparing you for the final exam. The final exam will be very much like your second midterm exam, which I haven't finished marking yet. I've done two thirds, I still have to do about 20, 25 uh, exams to mark. And the final exam, in terms of format, it will be very similar to the second midterm exam. So there will be problems, there will be programs that you'll need to fix, and short questions uh, that you'll need to answer as well. So I'm not going to introduce new concepts anymore. We will pick up a few new ideas here and there on how to implement uh, things in MATLAB. But I'm going to structure this from now on. So far, we've been focusing on the language itself and what does it mean and how, to, how do we use it, a whole range of functions that are available. Uh, the debugging, uh, stuff like that. So we're going to use all of them. And in 2176, which I will be teaching next term, some of you may be taking, we'll continue with that, okay, problem solving. So that course is about mathematical model building and solving using computers. So here we're just learning how to use computers, uh, particularly MATLAB and Excel. And if there is time in one lecture, I will show you how to do Aspen uh, simulations as well. So we are just going to st read a problem, understand it, and start writing the code. <coughs> Make mistakes along the way and try to learn how to fix those mistakes. Those are all the aspects that you will be looking at in the final exam. Okay. So the first problem is a fairly straightforward problem. We are given a system of four linear algebraic equations in the variable x, y, z, and t. So we're going to put this in the form, a matrix A multiplied by a vector x equals a vector B. Okay. In linear algebra, you would have seen that. A matrix takes a vector, multiplied by it, gives you a new vector. So we want, in this case, we want to find out which vector x, which when multiplied by A, will give you B. So A is known and B is known, and you want to solve for x. A number of problems in the steady state process simulation in chemical engineering can be cast in this form. Now, the other type of problem that we have seen is f of x equal to 0. Again, x can be a vector, f can be a vector, meaning four equations in four unknowns, but they are nonlinear. If they are nonlinear, we will represent in this form f of x equal to 0. And the MATLAB function that solves this is f sol. Okay? If it is linear, we will cast it in this form, because we are able to separate the knowns and the unknowns if it is linear. So ax equal to b. So the x vector contains all the unknowns. And the MATLAB function that solves this is x equals a backslash b. So our task for linear problems would I'm going to show one of each kind today, a linear problem and a nonlinear problem. 
Okay. So our task, given a linear problem, is to assemble this matrix A and the vector B. We've done it a couple of times, but one more time, it doesn't hurt. And we will see a few uh, features, uh, particularly we are asked to use f print f to display each variable x, y, z, and t, each variable and its corresponding value in four lines. So there is a specification on how you want the output to be structured. Okay. So the first thing that you need to realize is that you need to write these equations in the form of Ax equal to b. That means you need to find out what A and what b would be. Okay. So A would be a matrix. What would be the size? Four by four. And this has to be multi when multiplied by x, y, z, and t. So I'm going to call this vector with an underscore. That's a vector. And that's going to consist of these four unknowns, x, y, z, and t. Sometimes we will just use a subscripted variable, x1, x2, x3, x4. Okay? But in this particular problem, they are used, they have used different symbols for the four unknowns, x, y, z, and t. So when we multiply this, we want to get the right hand side, which will be equal to this quantity. Okay, so the vector b will contain those numbers. But what will the first line contain? 1, 1, 1, and 1. Because it is x plus y plus z plus t equals 4. So on the right hand side, I'm going to also write b. The first element of b would be 4. So that gives you the first equation when you do the matrix multiplication. The second one would be 2 minus 1. 0, 1. Okay, and on the right hand side, you'll have 2. And in the th so you, you can see the pattern. It's basically taking each row from the equation and putting the coefficients in the right place. And the third one would be 3, 1, minus 1, minus 1. And on the right hand side, it'll be 2. And the fourth one will be 1, minus 2, minus 3, 1 will be minus 3. Okay. Now, having figured this out, in an exam, I would expect you to do that. Yeah. Having figured this out, then <coughs> either I give you a program with errors, you fix it, or you write a program. That will be part of the final exam as well, simple, simple programs like this. Okay. So let's go to MATLAB and see how we would implement that. Okay. So I'm going to edit problem 1, dot m. So there are a number of ways that you can assemble this matrix. Um, I guess I need to switch between the two. So the first line, I, I can enter all the four rows, one after the other in MATLAB. So you can either do, for example, A 1 comma 1 equals 1, and fill every one of them like that. or you can simply say A, the matrix, is equal to 1, 1, 1, 1, semicolon. So you're filling all four rows, uh, all four elements in the first row in one, one instance. Okay? And then uh, the next one is 2 minus 1, 0, 1. Now, you have the choice of just going to the next line and continuing to enter. Okay? So, or continuing on the same line. Either one would work. Because once you open the square brackets on the left side, until you close it on the right hand side, MATLAB is going to continue to expect input. Only when you close it, it matches it, and then it says, okay, the definition is complete, and it's going to check whether it is syntactically correct or not. Okay? So 2 minus 1, 0, 1. 2 minus 1, 0, 1. And uh, I'm sorry, you guys can help me if you remember it. 3, 1, minus 1, minus 1. 3, 1, minus 1, minus 1. 1, minus 3, minus 3, 1. Is that correct? Thank you. Okay. And then B is equal to 4, 2, 2, minus 3. 4, 2, 2, minus 3. I'm going to put a transpose there. Why would I want to put a transpose? Because I want to create a column vector. Okay. And then the next point, I say x is equal to a backslash b. And that will give me the solution. 
if you want, if they don't put a semicolon, and it will just print out the results, okay, for x, y, z, t. But in this particular problem, we are asked to print each variable in one line at a time with an identification, which variable is for which value, okay? So I'm going to create a vector called xc, and in that, I'm going to put um, the four values. And what are they? X, x, y, z, x, y, z, and t, thank you, okay? So what I'm creating here is an array, but it's a character array, okay? Because I'm putting it in quotation mark. So in that character array, I'm putting four values, which are characters, x, y, z, and t, okay? So I'm going to save that. Now, if you don't understand what it is doing, you can always go to MATLAB and create that in the command window and see what it does, x, y, z, t, okay? And then if I say x, c of two, what do you think it'll print? Y, right? So I'm addressing the second element of that array, character array, right? Okay? So, and now I'm ready to assemble the output the way that they specifically want. F, print F, uh, variable. I want to put, substitute that particular string, variable X has a value variable y as a value. How can I do that? I put a placeholder percent c. That means in that place, it's going to substitute whatever the character that it is going to be, okay? Variable this has value of percent g backslash n. That means in the second place, put the actual value. In the plus first place, char percent c, put the symbol, okay? And I end that. Are you, make, are you following what I'm trying to do? If you have any questions, please ask me. Yeah? What, what's, why is C there? Is that just you pick C? No, no. This you should know. The formatting command allows certain placeholders. The placeholder will always have the person sign followed by a symbol. That symbol stands for the type of variable that has to be substituted. C stands for a character variable that will be substituted. G stands for any general number. Okay, I stands for an integer, okay? So if you ask for help on fprintf, it'll give you what, all, what are all the possible placeholders that are allowed <laughs> with the person sign. That's the kind of thing I want you to learn incrementally on your own, and when, you're, when we are introducing something new like that, it's a slight extension. You have to ask me, what does it do, okay? But one thing I promise you in an exam, you will have only those things that we have seen in this class. As I said, MATLAB is huge. There are many things that we haven't seen, uh, but you should have the ability to learn them on your own, on your own as you need, okay? So the person C is a placeholder for a character, and person G is a placeholder for a number, and I finish that, uh, and I put a comma. So remember, fprintf is a function. That function takes any number of inputs in parentheses. The first input is the character string, which is going to construct from the information that we give. The next one, what do you think I should put? Xc, right? But I should pick particular value at a time. So I'm going to put an i. Pick, for example, when i equal to 1, pick the first value. When i equal to 2, pick the second value. Then I would say xi. Okay, so the first xc goes to the person c. The second x, which is the solution that I have obtained, goes with the person g. And then I can close that and end that one. Now, will this program work? Why? You have to put a for i. Exactly. I have to put a for loop because what I have done is I've constructed what the output is, but when it tries to execute at this time, i will be undefined. xc is defined, x is defined, everything else in that statement is fine, but i is undefined. <laughs> the intent that I was planning to do was to go through this as a loop for as many variables as there are output. So in this case, I need to put a for loop, and if you are seeing this, as he did, you are doing very well in this course, okay? But if you don't, then you need to pay attention, okay? So for i equal to 1 colon 4, because I have four times I have to go through this, and I go through that loop, and end. When you write a function like this from scratch, it will never work for the first time, okay? The next task is to figure out in an assignment, hopefully you will get those skills. Where does, it, where does it fail? Why does it fail? How do I fix it? 
And in an exam, I will test that part by putting some deliberate bugs and trying to see whether you can identify that. So I'm going to save that and then run it. It's a script file. It's not a function file. So I should be able to just run that. And if there are no errors, I should get the result in the command window. There it is. Well, variable x has a value of 1. Variable y has a value of 1. Z has a value of 1. T has a value of 1. Do you think that makes sense? How would you verify whether this is the correct solution? It says x. All the four variables have just one, right? How would you verify? It's a linear algebra. Exactly. <coughs> linear algebra question. A times x minus b. What should that be equal to? Zero. How many zeros will I get? Four zeros. If I want to calculate the residual, I can pass it to norm. So what does norm do? It calculates the length of that vector. Of course, it should still be zero because it's simply first element squared plus second element squared plus third element squared plus fourth element squared square root of that. Something like that. Okay. So that shows that you have the correct solution. The same idea you should also be able to apply for nonlinear equations. Once you get the solution, you should check whether the solution satisfies those equations. That is, what is the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of that equation? That is called the residual of the remaining uh, difference. Normally, it will be of the order of 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 16, depending on the precision that we use. But these are all pure integer numbers. So there is no round-off error. If you use floating point numbers, then you will have round-off errors. Okay, any questions on that? That was a simple problem. The next problem is a more complicated problem. I don't know whether we'll be able to finish it, but let's just get started. Okay, second example. So there is the code. Now, this is the kind of problem that you will see later on in unit ops course, but you might have seen also in 2171. Okay, simple mass balance. But I have to explain to you what chemical process this one is. It's called an absorption column or a stripping column. These are often used as a pair in most uh, gas plants, for example. One of the applications will be the natural gas that comes from the field contains hydrogen sulfide in it. So sour gas. Okay? And you want to get rid of the hydrogen sulfide before you ship the gas to the homes or to the power plant. Okay? So what you do is you use a solvent, a mean. Uh, monoethanol amine is an example. So th the solvent is used to treat the gas that comes in, into the process vessel. So it's typically a column with several trays, but here I'm schematically representing it as n different stages. In each stage, this is called a countercurrent um, contact between those. So the gas goes this way and the liquid comes this way. V is the flow rate of the gas and L is the flow rate of the liquid. And Y is the composition, mass fraction or mole fraction of that particular component. So if the gas stream contains a lot of mixtures but hydrogen sulfide, and you want to keep track of what happens to the hydrogen sulfide. So YN plus one could stand for the hydrogen sulfide composition at the entrance, okay? And because hydrogen sulfide is selectively soluble in the solvent, I mean, it will go and dissolve in it. So the gas that you get outside is going to contain less hydrogen sulfide almost pure gas without hydrogen sulfide, for example, would be the ideal one that we require. So the solvent that comes out of it is going to have a lot of hydrogen sulfide dissolved in it. That process is called an absorption problem, basically a dissolution from the gas phase into the liquid phase. The question then is, what do I do with the solvent that I have, which has a lot of sulfur, hydrogen sulfide dissolved in it? I want to regenerate that solvent and reuse it. So it goes to the next unit called a stripper unit where you contact it with a steam or another gas, inert gas, which doesn't have any hydrogen sulfide. So the solvent, I mean, gives out all the hydrogen sulfide to the gas phase. And the solvent becomes free of hydrogen sulfide, which is recycled into this. So here it goes to the stripper, and here it comes back to the absorber. So they act as a pair of units to effectively clean the gas. And of course, what you've done is you've transferred the hydrogen sulfide from the natural gas stream to another stream, okay, which will be further processed. Probably you convert that into sulfur and spiral them up, whatever it is. Okay? So that's the process. And what we have shown here is simple mass balance that you have learned how to do in 2171. 
So we take, for example, the first stage, okay? V times Y2 minus Y1. V is the flow rate, Y2 is the mass fraction. So V times Y2 is the amount of hydrogen sulfide that is entering that stage, minus V times Y1, that is the amount of hydrogen sulfide that is leaving that stage. That is the net difference between what enters and leaves that stage one. What must happen to it? It must, goes to the, it must go to the liquid phase, right? So that will be equal to <coughs> L times X1 minus X0. Which one would be higher, X1 or X0? X1 must be higher, right? The solvent comes without any hydrogen sulfide. X0 is almost close to zero. And then you are adding some hydrogen sulfide from the gas phase to the liquid phase. So X1 will be typically greater than X0. So the concentration of X will increase in this direction. And the concentration of Y will decrease in this direction because the hydrogen sulfide goes from the gas phase to the liquid phase in each one of them. So we set up all these model equations. We write one such equation for every stage. We can assemble them as a set of linear algebraic equation in a matrix form and solve for the unknowns. Okay? Or there is a method that was developed before the computer era, before we could assemble matrices and solve them by just hand. And that is called the Kremser equation, which is essentially a rearrangement of all these equations. But Kremser was able to eliminate all the intermediate compositions, x1, x2, all the way to x minus 1, similarly yn, y3, y1. He was able to relate only the inlet to the outlet concentration. So it becomes a single equation. But it's a single equation containing many variables. So this is exactly the same information contained in all those n equations, okay? but given to you in a form which has only inlet composition, x0 and outlet composition, xn, yn plus 1. So it relates input and output concentrations. Now, s is called a separation factor, and it is defined as L divided by kb. L is the liquid flow rate, b is the vapor flow rate. And k is called, called the equilibrium ratio. That is, solubility has a limit. In one stage, you cannot dissolve all the hydrogen sulfide into the liquid phase, and that's why you need multi-stage, okay? So the k is a measure of that solubility limit. It's a thermodynamic limit. Thermodynamics tells us how to get this number k. It can actually be functions of temperature and pressure and even concentration. So in a thermo class, you will learn how to build models to predict k. For our problem, we're going to assume k is a constant, okay? So S is L divided by kV. S may be known in some cases. It may not be known. Any questions so far on the problem? Okay? So. We have a single equation with several symbols in them. And those symbols, let me just list one more time. x0, xn, yn plus 1, k, and l, and b, and n. n is the actual total number of stages. Okay? n refers to how many stages do you have? How tall is your column, for example? Okay? The longer the number, larger the number of trays, the more separation you can achieve. That is the lower the concentration that you can get for Y1. Okay? So if you have, for example, the inlet concentration is 0.8, if you use only two stages, you may be able to get it only down to 0.6. If you use 20 stages, you may be able to get it down to 0 0.02. So as a process chemical engineer, now your task is to answer process-related questions. Pose problems and answer those questions as a solution to this particular problem. Okay? Is this solution linear or is this equation linear or nonlinear? It depends on what you're solving for, okay? So you have one equation with all these symbols. So the degree of freedom that you have is, in this case, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven symbols with one equation. So you must be specified six of these variables. Then you can solve for the seventh variable, okay? And this, these six variables can be any one of those lists from the list, okay? So each problem then becomes uh, a challenge in itself. So a design engineer may be looking at it from one point of view, whereas a, a process engineer who goes into an existing plant may be looking at it from a different point of view. Okay? How do I get more out of it? What happens if I, the plant is already exists, so n is given, the number of stages is fixed, and if I increase the solvent rate, what happens to the exit concentration? A process engineer might answer questions like that. Whereas a design engineer might say, okay, I need to take this hydrogen sulfide from 0.8 mole fraction to 0 0.0002 mole fraction because that's an environmental requirement. 
So how many stages do I need? That's a design problem, okay? I'm trying to find out, answer how many stages I need to achieve that. We're going to look at both problems and see how we can set this up in MATLAB, okay? So the first question, in a design stripping problem, <coughs> so that whether it is absorption or stripping, what, what determines that? The direction of mass transfer. If the ma direction of mass transfer is from the gas phase to the liquid phase, it's absorption. If the direction of mass transfer is from the liquid phase to the gas phase, then it is stripping. Okay? So in the first problem, it is a design but a stripping problem. Okay? It's a design problem, meaning you need to find what n is. Typically in a design problem, you need to find the number of stages. Okay? And the direction of mass transfer is given by uh, stripping. In a final exam, you might have variations on this kind of a question. There is another equation which is given only in terms of the mole fractions or weight fractions in the gas phase. This is all given in terms of liquid phase, for example. Okay? So you should be able to understand the problem enough to be able to do it by either one of them. Okay, so let's take the first question and see whether we can write a function to answer that. In a design stripping problem, the transfer takes place from the liquid to the gas. Okay? Uh, you are you have to find the number of stages n needed to achieve a given separation. So you are given x0, you are given yn plus 1, you are given v, you are given xn, you are given l. So if you look at that equation, okay, you are given x0, you are given xn, you are given yn plus 1, k is known, and you are given l and v, so you know what s is. So what is the unknown? n. So is it linear or nonlinear? something to the power n, right? So it's not easy to separate the n out from this equation, okay? So it is a nonlinear equation. That's what tells you f solve is the natural choice for you to use, okay? So you need to write a function that will write this as the function as a function of n is equal to the left-hand side minus the right-hand side. You rearrange that equation as the left-hand side minus right-hand side equal to zero, okay? And in that equation, you identify n as the unknown that you're going to solve for. Everything else must be given in that particular problem. Once you write that function, you use that with f solve to find the answer to that particular question. Okay? So is the problem clear? Maybe you can help me write the function. Okay? So I need to write the function, and I need to write a script to call that particular function. Okay? So I'm going to write the function first. <coughs> Um, I guess I don't need all these. So it's going to be, the output is going to be f, the function value itself. And I'm going to call this as problem 2a. <coughs> and I'm going to identify what would be the input to this function. What am I solving for? n. Okay. So I, I have to give n as a guess, and it will return the function <coughs> value. And if the function value is not zero, then f solve will take over the task of finding that value of n that will make that function equal to zero. Okay? So what do I do next? In the next line, what should I do? I have identified, I've given the function a name, and I have identified the unknown, the parameter, that is the n. Okay? So I'm given all the other values. So I need to define what those values are, right? So let me see whether I can do it here. So I will have a statement like x0 is equal to 0 0.8. Okay, that's given to me, okay? x is not an array here. x0 is just a variable, okay? And then I have y, I'm going to call it np1, n plus 1, y np1 is equal to 0, okay? then v is equal to 10. And xn is equal to 0 0.015. And l is equal to 7. 2, 4, 6. Six of the seven variables are given, and the seventh variable is the unknown n that I need to solve for. So what do I do next? <coughs> are you guys with me, or 
I know a few are, but I want to make sure that everybody is. What do I do next? I program that function. How do I program that function? F is equal to left hand side minus the right hand side. That is F equal to zero. It's not going to be equal to zero unless we have the right value of n. We need to find that value of n that makes that function equal to zero. So I just need to write this x0 minus xn, <coughs> so the same symbols, divided by x0 minus ynp1 divided by k. When I write that, I realize, whoops, I need a value of k. Everything else I have defined so far. k is given too. So I forgot to include that k. k is 0 0.8, for example. Okay. Remember, when you are writing an, a, a statement in MATLAB, everything that appears to the right hand side must be defined before it can be used. Okay. So x0 is defined, xn is defined, again x0, ynp1 is defined, and k is defined. Minus 1 divided by s to the power n plus 1. Okay. And I need to put this in parenthesis minus, I'm going to make some <coughs> deliberate mistakes here, you need to catch, okay? Have we done everything right so far? No. What is the problem? Yes. I haven't defined what S is, right? So when MATLAB comes to execute this line, it will say X is undefined. So what I have to do is go and include S, but I know what the definition for S is. It is L divided by K divided by V. k times v, but this is the same. Why is it the same? I can do k times v, right? Or I can do the way I did, which would mean it's using the precedence ordering. So it's going to do from left to right. So it will first find L over k and take that and divide it by v, okay? So they're both going to be the same. Either one would be fine, okay? Now I have defined s and I'm going to divide this by 1 divided by s to the power n plus 1 minus 1. Would that work? This is the kind of errors you will see in your final exam program. I give you the program, but if you apply the precedence ordering, everything here seems fine. This is the numerator, right? 1 plus 1 over s to the power n plus 1. And divided by this. Divided by, which is the entire denominator now, okay, but I need to put a parenthesis there. Otherwise, it's going to do divide by 1 over s to the power n and then subtract the 1, okay? So I need to have a parenthesis there, and that parenthesis must be matched with that. Now it is. Is there any other error in that? n plus 1, I must put in parenthesis. Otherwise, it will take 1 over s to the power n and then add 1. Because exponentiation is before multiplication and division, which is before addition and subtraction. Right? So I should put very good. I think I'm very happy that many of you are doing well. In the exam also, so far what I marked, it looks pretty good. Okay? Uh, it's a kind of a bimodal distribution. That's what <coughs> worries me about. Some are doing very well, some are struggling, okay? So, and if you don't come to me asking for help, I really don't know how I can be helpful, okay? So with that, I end that, and then I put an end. So that function is defined, okay? Now I need to find that value of n that will make that function equal to zero using fsol, okay? So I need to write a script file that will call this and uh, then f solve should be able to solve. Now I want to make sure that it works, okay? So I'm going to give it a, <coughs> a yeah, that's fine, <coughs> default name. And I'm going to go to MATLAB and execute that just to make sure that it works fine. P to A, fine. I'm saying if n is equal to five, what will be the function value? Obviously there is an error. <laughs> the statement is not inside any function. So what did I, what mistake did I make? Is 
follows an end that tells <coughs> the definition. Oh, there is a space here. Is that a problem? I thought that, oh, there are two ends. Okay. That is a problem. So when I put an end, it finishes the first function definition, and then there is extraneous materials. I think that's what it is complaining about. Let's try it again. Yeah. Okay. Now, will this function work if I ask it to do for two different values of n? No. Why? <coughs> because I have not used the dot exponentiation, dot product, dot star, dot. So unless I use that, I have not generalized it for multiple values of n. n must be just a scalar value. And that's the only one that will work. Here it will give an error. There it is. Okay? But FSOL requires you to pass only one value at a time. So you really don't need to generalize it to do multiple values of n unless you are trying to find the solution yourself by graphically, by plotting it, for example. Okay? But let's now write the script file that will go with it and see whether we can get the solution so that we can move on to the next problem. Okay? Um, Problem two a. So n is equal to f sol. Okay. So the name of the function p two a comma. What should I give? An initial guess for n, right? So I'm going to say take phi as the guess. Okay. And um, I'm not putting a semicolon so that I can see the results out. And I can save this uh, to script and run this. So I gave it a guess of 5, and it returns a value of 15.02. Number of stages can now be a fraction. So as an engineer, you would then say, OK, I need maybe 15 or 16 stages to achieve that separation. How do I check whether this is the correct answer? I call that function and pass this value of n. What should I get? <coughs> A small number, 10 to the minus 4. Why is it 10 to the minus 4? Why is it not 10 to the minus 16? There is something called that fsol makes an arbitrary decision. Okay, that decision is, if my answers are accurate to four digits, I stop. That is a default. Okay? But you can change that to more precise result by using something called um, options. So if you ask for help, FSOL, what we are seeing now is how to learn a little bit more about FSOL. We know the <coughs> basic function of FSOL, but we are learning how to control the other features. So now, now I have a solution that's four digits accurate. For most practical purposes, that will be enough. But if I want to find a result that's more accurate, how do I do that? So I go and ask for fsol help, and it tells me that there is a parameter called options, the third parameter. The first parameter is the name of the function. The second one is the initial guess for the unknown that I'm solving for. And then there is something called options. So the options contains a lot of things that you can control about fsol. In 2171, we'll continue to learn how fsol actually solves for it. From that, you will understand what are the choices available under options and how we set it. But the way to set that variable options is through something called uh, optim set. Okay? That's a function that sets these options. So if you ask for help on optim set, it then tells you all the things that you can set up. Options, the way to use that is options equals optim set. Optim set is a name of a function, okay? That it allows you to set many different options about that particular function. And the only one that I'm going to talk about, the typical structure is this, optim set, some parameter, its value, okay? The only parameter that we are going to set is the error control, okay? I'm going to go back, and before I call this, I'm going to create a variable called options. And optim set. 
So I'm calling the function optim set, which sets these options for me, and the options is called <coughs> relative tolerance. R E L T O L. It's a keyword. You have to use it as it is. And this value is going to be 1 e to the power minus 12. That tells that I want a solution with an error of 10 to the minus 12. The function should be smaller than 10 to the minus 12, not just 10 to the minus 4. And then I pass that <coughs> options to this. Are you following me? We are learning how to control finer aspects of f solve, and one of them, crucial one from an error control point of view, is this variable called relative tolerance. In MATLAB, they use the variable R E L T O L. You can take a value, you can control the value. And the way you control the value is by creating line two there and storing the value into options. Okay? So now let's try that. It gave me an error. Uh, what is the error? Ah, so I was wrong about relative tolerance. Let me say what it is. T O L F U N. Sorry, it's my mistake. Okay, it's not called R E L. In another function, it's called R E L T O L. Here, it's called T O L. F -U -N. That is a tolerance on the function. I want the function to be less than a particular value. These are the frustrating things about any programming language. Somebody chose to call it as tall fun in one function and REL tall in another one. Okay. So now let's go back and run that script. There it is. Okay. And you can once again verify. And well, we said 10 to the minus 12, but it was able to do 10 to the minus 10 at the best. But it is clearly much more accurate than the previous one. Okay? So let's go to the next problem. Any questions on that? The next problem is more of a serious chemical process engineer. Okay? So you need to really understand <coughs> what the problem is about. Um, it's the same problem, the same set, but the question is, as xn is changed from 0.2 to 0.002, previous case xn was given as 0.015, okay? xn, if you want to see what that is, remember, xn is the exit concentration, okay? It comes in with zero, it picks up the hydrogen sulfide, and it will increase if it is an absorption, but if it is a stripping, it comes with X0, which is a very high value, and it gives out the hydrogen sulfide. And Xn should be a very small value. And that is the problem we are looking at. Okay? It's a stripping problem, so Xn should decrease. So if I want Xn to change from 0.2 to 0.002, how does the number of stages needed change? Plot Xn versus N. So here is also a plotting exercise for you. Okay? Do you understand the problem? How is it different from the previous one? You don't have a good understanding of what the second problem is about, right? For the, are there any questions on the first part of the problem? We had a single equation with a single unknown. Everything else was given, and we used f solve to get a solution. We have done this many times. Now we are looking at different varieties of chemical problems where you can use f solve. So the first problem is for a single case. If I want the exit concentration to be 0 0.015 in the liquid phase, how many stages do I need to do that job? And the answer was about 15 stages, for example. Okay. Now. The second problem is, is a more of a design problem because I want to, as an operator, I want to develop a chart by instead of solving this every time, and this is how it was done, in fact, in the 40s and 50s, before the days of the computers, they would have an operating chart, and the chart they just have to read, okay? And the chart should tell you, if I need a concentration of 0 0.05 in the exit, how many stages do I need? If I need a concentration of 0 0.002, how many stages do we need? Okay? And if the concentration is 0.2, how many stages do we need? The inlet concentration is 0.8. 
from 0.8, I want to decrease it. Maybe I want to decrease it to 0.2 or 0.15 or 0.1. So what do, what do I have to do to the function that I have to solve this particular problem? That's what I'm asking you in MATLAB. Dots. Pardon me? Do you have to put dots for the similar sense and so on? Um, that's a good thought. You just want to put dots everywhere so that you can operate on a vector, right? That's your thought. But remember, for any particular value of xn that I give you, whether it is 0 0.015s in the first case or 0.2 in the second case, I need to make a call to f solve. So for every, so I'm basically solving the first problem repeatedly for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. So I'm solving the first problem, but for different values of the exit composition, and for each value I want to find the number of stages. Okay, so. I need to set up a loop, a for loop, around the problem that I solved earlier, but with eight times, calling it eight times. And then once I generate the data, I can plot it. Okay? So I don't know whether we have the time to write it. Maybe I will show you the function that I have written and uh, take you through that. And I have put the whole function for all the remaining problems too. And I do want you to take a look at that. So this was what we did for part one. Okay. And I have a few embellishments, printing out the result, etc. For part two, what I did is I created a variable called XN list. So that list contains every outlet composition for which I want to find the number of stages. Okay. And this is the initial guess, n equal to 5. And then I set up a loop for i equals 1 to length of XN list. That is, However many number of po data points there are in XN list, I want to do the calculation as many times. So the length function finds that, counts that, and finds that. And then I, from XN list, I pick that value. When i equal to 1, I pick the first value, which is 0.2. When i equal to 2, I'll pick the second value, which is 0.15. And I put that in XN. Okay? And the, remember, the way that, uh, I mean, th there's an interesting variation I'm showing here. The way I pass XN, you can do it with global. We already know how to do it. But FSOL allows you to pass a second parameter. The first parameter is the unknown that you're solving for. FSOL is going to solve for n. But in this case, you want to change a second parameter, xn, continuously to different values. Okay? So the way to pass that is the structure that I've shown here. FSOL, open parenthesis, the at sign, which says what is the function name. But that function is going to contain two arguments n and xn. n is the unknown, xn is a fixed number, okay, which will take different values each time it solves for it. And so you need to identify that n as the unknown. Okay, so you put that in parenthesis and then give the name of the function and n, xn, comma, n, the guess for it, and then the options. Once it solves, it returns the value of n into that variable, and you take that and construct a new list, n list. N list is going to contain the list of number of stages required for each XN, the composition that you see in line 12. So XN list and N list will have the same length. And you can just plot one against the other. This plot will generate that graph for you. Okay? Any questions on that particular function? Yeah? So <coughs> designing the F solve function that way, is that the only way that you can solve multiple? No, that is one way of solving uh, many, I mean, putting it in a loop to solve it many times, but passing and changing a second value every time. So xn is going to be the second value here that will be changed every time that you are calling. And if we run through this, for example, set up a breakpoint and run through that, you will see. OK, so I'm solving the second problem. And I have xn list, a variable containing all the exit compositions. Okay? And the first time around, xn is going to contain the first number, 0.2. And the control is going to go to fsol with a value initial guess of n equal to 5 and xn equal to 0.2. And fsol has solved it now, returned the value of n. 
the actual value of n is 2.38 when the outlet composition was 0.2 okay and i'm building a new vector n list which is going to store all those values so n list now has that value 2.38 okay now what is going to happen n will be 2 and so what will be the value for xn 0.15 and I go to fsol again but taking a value of 0.15 this time okay and there are many ways of doing it this is one way the other way would be to put it make xn as a global variable and declare it as a global variable in the function also here the, I name the function as e2p2 okay is that your question okay so it just it's going to go through eight times now you can see that n list will have four values because we have solved it four times. And what you see is as the exit composition is decreased, the number of stages increases. So if you want to remove more hydrogen sulfide, you need more stages. And this tells you precisely what that relationship is. Okay? So I think we are <coughs> time. Let me just show you how the graph looks. You're almost out of time. So go through the remaining part of the code, run it, and uh, understand. Because these are the kinds of things that you're going to be facing in the final exam. There is no function. <coughs>